All right, greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins and rose again the third day. My name is Brother Ed, and Brother Justin is with me. Got my wingman here, and uh, we're back for another session of, of Bible Q&A, Monday night, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you're watching on YouTube, watching the re-uploaded program, you can get in on this thing by following my Facebook page and um Usually, if you're watching on YouTube, you will you can go to the About tab, and you can find all the information you need to get on my Facebook page. And if you friend me, if you friend request me, I will follow you, or I'll friend you, and that way you can get on this broadcast, ask your questions, and so forth, okay? Now, for those of you that are new to the broadcast, if you look down on the bottom of the screen, you'll see the scrolling thing going across your screen. And it, it actually, what it is, it just says, send questions to... Trust the Lord Jesus at gmail.com. And I still find people saying, how do you send questions to Brother Ed and Brother Justin? How do you send questions? And I'm like, it's right there. Oh, can I point to it? Let me see. How do I do this? How do I do this? Right there. Point <laughs> down. Right there. See it? Bam. Right there. See it? Uh, trust the Lord Jesus at gmail.com. You can send your question. It may not be answered right away. Be patient. We will get to your question. I don't dismiss anybody's question. I have a list of questions we're going through right now, and we're hitting these one at a time in each broadcast. The broadcasts are fairly short. We only do this for an hour. Sometimes we go over a little bit. Um, actually, I went in two hours the last broadcast, but we, we try our best to keep it within a time frame. okay? That's why I need to hurry up and talk so we can get to the questions here. So um, first things first, you can have all your questions answered but where will your soul spend eternity? See, it doesn't matter how much knowledge you have. It matters if you have the right knowledge and what are you going to do with the knowledge you have concerning that right knowledge? And the right knowledge is that Jesus Christ died for your sins and he rose again the third day for the salvation of your soul. And if you trust and believe on him, you will receive the salvation of your soul. But you've got to trust and believe on him. And there's got to be a certain point in time in your life where you do that, where you say, I'm going to believe what Jesus did for me. It's just not some general knowledge where you just say, well, I know about Jesus. Yeah, you know, I've, I've done that already. I, I, I believe in him every day. No, there has to be an initial act where you believe and trust where a transaction is happening right there. The free gift is now yours because you're receiving it and you've trusted in him and he's received uh, uh, or now you're, you're receiving that redemption and he's giving you that redemption. Because see, Jesus died for everybody, but not everybody's redeemed. You've got to trust in him to be redeemed. Okay. So we want you to be redeemed. That's why we're on here, but we can't redeem you. This is something you have to do by putting your faith and your trust in the finished cross work of Jesus Christ. I'm going to go ahead and let Justin open up now. Go ahead, brother. Amen. Thanks, brother Ed. Good to be here. Good to be back on the broadcast. Um, and uh, thank you guys for a asking questions. It's uh, a joy to always be in the Bible. Um, oh, joy to be studying it. Joy to be teaching it. And uh, certainly love that. And uh, I would I would tell y'all this is this is life and life more abundant. People think oh, I'm gonna find uh, happiness or joy or uh, the, all those things out in the world. You're not gonna find those things out in the world. You're gonna find them in Jesus Christ. The Bible says of this man that he shall be the peace. You won't have peace without Jesus Christ. You won't have joy without Jesus Christ. And uh, everything you you think you could get in this world will just be temporary, fleeting moments of of pleasure mirth but uh but nothing that would abide so pray i pray that you amen trust him. appreciate that brother justin um i always enjoy justin getting on here with me so two heads are better than one uh get a different take on a question is always good and uh, Justin, a lot of times, uh, puts out information from the Bible that I haven't even thought about. And that's exactly on point. So I do appreciate Brother Justin and his knowledge. He has a lot of knowledge of the Bible. And and I don't I don't take that for granted. I, I, I really prefer Justin to be on here with me. And so, uh, amen. Praise the Lord. So let's go ahead. Uh, without further ado, let's get on to the first question here. And it's from Romeo Navidad. And from what I understand, he's a new new follower uh, on my Facebook page. And uh, he did ask this question on one of our broadcasts. And I thought, you know, 
even though he asked it on the Facebook page and didn't email this to me, I I, I, I still want to answer it. I mean, he, he's asking an objective question, and I think it's only fair that that we answer his question as I promote on my on my Facebook page. You want to ask a question, even though you may not have emailed it to me, we're going to do our best to try to answer it. So um, here's this question. Brother, can you explain about tithes and offerings? Because so many Christians are confused about these. So I'll try to open up a little bit with this one and then I'll pass it over to Justin because normally I let Justin's always start off and I feel bad because <laughs> Justin's like, okay, you're going to get me again. With <laughs> so let's, so I, I'm going to take the heat on this one. I'll open up and then, uh, then I'll give it over to Justin and he can say what he wants about it. Okay. So go to Malachi three, go to Malachi three. I think this would be a good opening. Now, what I'm about to present to you, uh, a lot of it comes from the fascinating truths book from pastor James W. Knox. And I've learned a lot lot from Pastor James W. Knox over the years of graduating Bible school, and I believe, you know, Justin as well. And um, we do our best uh, not only to just regurgitate uh, something that somebody else had already preached, but we try to study it out to be able to explain it ourselves. So even though I'm using a platform of Brother James's book, uh, mind you, we're going to be openly talking about this. We're going to be giving you the verses, okay? So uh, Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Now, now, let's look at this. It says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord, whom ye seek, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. A few things I want you to, to note and point in the passage. The word temple, right before the comma, and the word messenger of the covenant. Okay, now look at verse 2. But who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. Now, another another thing to point out concerning the context, who may abide the day of his coming? You got to find out what that day is. And in the context, we are dealing with the second coming of Jesus Christ. So right now we're not dealing in the church of Ephesians. We're not dealing in the church of Galatia. We're dealing in a future time. So that's already a red flag as to the context if we're going to be talking about tithes in Malachi 3. Now, go to verse 3, Malachi 3.3. 3. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify, now watch this, key words, the sons of Levi. Highlight that in your Bible. And purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Now, highlight the word offering offering in righteousness. Um, that's what Levites would do. Okay. Now Malachi 3, 4, then shall the offering of, now watch, highlight this, Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. So you're highlighting Judah and Jerusalem. It doesn't say the church and say members of the body of Christ. It says Judah and Jerusalem. So context is everything. That's how you get out of falsehood. Now look at verse five, and I will come near to you, or I will come near to you to judgment, and I will be a, a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against false swearers and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. Verse six, for I'm the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye, now watch, sons of Jacob, highlight that. Sons of Jacob, who are we talking to? Sons of Jacob, Judah and Jerusalem, sons of Levi. We're dealing with the temple in verse one, right? Are not consumed. Look at verse seven, Malachi 3, seven, the next verse. Even from the, now watch, the days of your fathers, highlight that. The days of your fathers, not the days of the church fathers, <laughs> the days of your fathers, the nation of Israel, Judah and Jerusalem, the sons of Levi. They're looking to look Jacob, who's Israel, right? You are gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye said, wherein shall we return? Verse eight, will a man rob God? Okay. Let's, let's ignore the context. 
Will you, church, will a man rob God? Will a church member rob God? It's not, you can't automatically flip from the context there, okay? Will a man rob God, yet ye have robbed me? Who is he talking to? Not the church. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. See? So there is a definition of offerings concerning the Old Testament, and there's a definition of tithes, and it's exclusively a definition in the Old Testament. But notice I, notice the word offerings. That's a more of a tricky word we're going to have to define, right? But tithes is pretty much exclusively Old Testament Israel. Malachi 3.9, ye are cursed with a curse. For ye have robbed me even this whole what? Nation. We are not a physical nation. We are not the sons of Jacob. We are not the sons of Levi. We are not Judah and Jerusalem. There is a physical place called the kingdom of heaven, and, and, and it's overseas. It's not here in America. I don't know these preachers that are preaching everything in the Bible is America, but you need to get away from that preacher. Because he's going to end up leading you astray in a lot of things more than tithing. He's probably going to have a problem with salvation too. So Malachi 3.10, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. It didn't say bring all ye the tithes into the church, the church house. So ye are cursed with a curse. We're dealing with a curse. We're dealing with a whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. We got a huge problem here, a dispensational problem. We got a huge problem, a kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven problem. We got a huge problem. You don't know the difference between the Jew, the Gentile, and the church of God. If you're saying this is to the church, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house. That there may be meat or money. <laughs> there may be barbecue meat, uh, bacon. <laughs> I got to say bacon when we talk about meat. <laughs> Okay, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour out, pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. So you're telling me the only time I'm blessed is, is if I do this, bring you know my tithe into the storehouse, my meat, my grains, my corn into the storehouse. That's the only time God's going to open up the windows of heaven and bless me? My friend, I've got, yeah, I'm already, I'm putting a cart before the horse. I got Jesus. <laughs> I got Jesus. I got his finished cross work. I'm already blessed. I'm not waiting to put some, some, some grain into the storehouse, which you call, which you, you know, replacement theology, which is the church house. It's not. A storehouse is a storehouse. A church house is a church house. Things that are different are not the same. I hope you can understand that little nugget of truth. So, bring all you the tithes into the storehouse. Well, I'm not a Jew. I'm not the son of Jacob. I'm not going to be cursed with a curse. My whole nation isn't the nation of Israel. I am the church. I'm a spiritual nation. You are cursed with a curse. No, I'm not. I'm not a Jew. So, ye all, ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour out you the blessing, that there shall not, uh, not be room enough to receive it. Man, I've got more in Jesus Christ than, than, than any tithe or offering a Jew could ever do in a storehouse. Malachi 3.11, and I, will, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. You know what Jesus did to the devourer? He destroyed the works. <laughs> I got Jesus. I got the finished cross work. Uh, and he shall not destroy the fruits of, of your ground. Why am I worried about fruits in the ground for? I'm worried about the fruits of my spirit. <laughs> Living my life every day for Jesus, not to earn my salvation, because he already earned it for me. And now I'm living my life in the light and the love of honoring him in my life every day. So I'm not trying to, to plant any you know, fruits in the ground or plant any seeds in the ground to get some fruits and worried about if I'm not going to tithe in the storehouse enough grain that God's going to curse my land. I'm not worried about that. I'm not worried about that. I have no worries about that. I'm the church. So Let's see, Malachi 3.11, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits for your, 
of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. Verse 12. Now, again, fruits, you need to underline fruits of your ground, underline your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field. We're dealing with literal fruits, harvesting fruits and vegetables. <laughs> Grains, Malachi 3.12, and all nations shall call you blessed. All nations are calling me. When did that ever happen? <laughs> Excuse me. We're talking about the nation of Israel here. They're not talking about the church. We're not talking about America because people apply America there. All And all nations shall call you blessed. We're talking about the nation of Israel because they are being blessed by God the Father for their obedience to the law, the law of tithing in this sense. For ye shall be a delightsome land. I need you to highlight this. Highlight all nations shall call you blessed. Highlight delightsome land. Delightsome land. Highlight that. Say it the Lord of hosts. When have you ever looked for a delightsome land? No, you know what people do? They use replacement theology and they try to redefine what a delightsome land is. They try to redefine what all nations shall call you blessed is. Well, that's America. See, we're a, we're a God-fearing nation. Really? Really? You, you ever heard of Chaz? No, we're not going to go down that road. <laughs> we're not a delightsome land, okay? We're not. We are an abom. I mean, if anything, we're an abomination to the Lord as a land. Okay, there's nothing about Christianity in this land. Republicans are not Christians. That's why they're called Republicans and not Christians. <laughs> they may try to rob some Christian principles from the Bible. So we're not going down that road. But I want I want to set you up for when somebody tries to use replacement theology. That's where they're going. They're saying, "Well, it's political. This is a political thing. It's not." We're dealing with God's chosen people that he chose in the physical body of flesh, these individuals that are called the nation of Israel, and he's given them laws to live by, to govern them in the land. And they're to obey these laws, and if they obey the laws, God will bless them physically with physical blessings. But what happens when they don't obey the law? What happens when they lean towards the Gentile ways? Well, God's not going to bless them. And it not only affects them in the flesh to be held captive by other nations, but it also curses the land. It's huge. They're all about the physical. God deals with them in the physical sense. God doesn't deal that way with the church because of Jesus Christ. So with that, I want to, I've said a lot here, and, and I've, I had a verse-by-verse verse rendering of each one of those, but I want to I go ahead because I want to give Justin a chance, but I just wanted to prove that Malachi 3 has no bearing. I mean, if you're talking about tithing and all that, Malachi 3 isn't even a factor for the church. So when you're thinking about tithing, don't even go to Malachi 3. So we've already took care of that. Now, pass over to Justin. Okay, thanks, Brother Red. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, so I, I'll say this. Let me let me start by saying this with regards to tithing versus giving, because I think that's probably where this is coming from. Um, Brother Ed and I are not against giving money to the church. Amen. Right? I mean, that's that, that is this is a biblical principle to give money to the church. In fact, First Corinthians chapter 16, you are ordered by God to give as the Lord hath prospered you upon the first day of the week. Right. So, Amen. so we believe that a that a saved, born again Christian, child of God, should give to his local church. You should. Amen. God has ordered you to do so. Right. So we we know this is true according to the Bible. And uh, I thought I'd get a couple of places here. Just what we're doing is we're defining the terms, right? We believe in giving, that, that a Christian should give. Look at Leviticus chapter 27. Leviticus chapter 27. Uh, look at the, look at verse number 30. The Bible says, and all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, it is the Lord's, it is 
holy unto the Lord. So what, what are we talking about when we're talking tithe? Just like you saw in Malachi chapter 3. Seed of the land, fruit of the tree. It's the Lord's, right? Um, verse number 31. And if a man will at all redeem all of his tithes, meaning he wants to keep the fruit of the ground, what does he got to do? He has to add the fifth part there, thereof. Add there to the fifth part thereof. So he's if he's going to convert it and give money, he's got to add the fifth part. And concerning the tithe of the herd or of the flock, even whatsoever passeth under the rod, the tenth, so there's your definition, shall be holy unto the Lord. So the, the tithe is a tenth of the increase of your sheep or of your ox or of your cattle or of the fruit of the ground or the fruits of the trees. All of those things would incorporate the tithe, which again is the, the tenth part that belongs to God for the nation of Israel. And uh, if you were going to convert that to money, then of course you have to add the fifth part there thereof. Um, now this is to be given. Uh, I, I think there's a couple of places. Let's get Exodus. Go back to Exodus chapter 23. And look at verse number 14. Three times thou shalt keep a feast unto me in the year. Thou shalt keep the feast of unleavened bread. Thou shalt eat un, uh, no. Uh, un, thou shalt eat unleavened bread seven days, as I commanded thee, in the time appointed of the month Abib. For in it thou camest out of, or out from Egypt, and none shall appear before me empty. And the feast of the of harvest, the first fruits of thy labors, which thou hast sown in the field, in the feast of ingathering, which is in the end of the year, when thou hast gathered in thy labors out of the field. Three times in the year all thy males shall appear before the Lord God. Thou shalt not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread, neither shall the fat of my sacrifice remain until the morning. Um, let's see, uh, verse number 19, the first uh, of the first fruits of thy land thou shalt bring into the house of the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not see the kid in his mother's milk. So just like Brother Ed was pointing to, we're talking about uh, physical uh, or farming, what, what you receive from farming. And according to Exodus, the nation of Israel, the males were to bring this three times a year. Right? That's that's what a tithe is. You're giving the tenth part uh, of your offering three times in a year. There's also another reference to Deuteronomy chapter 14 where there's something that's given or laid up for the Levites every three years. Right? So that's that's not Christian giving. Christian giving is every single week on the first day of the week we call that sunday i know some people are going to lose their mind if i say that but but on our calendar what we call the first day of the week is sunday and uh, and so god said on the first day of the week the church is to meet first of all second of all they're supposed to give as the lord hath hath provided for them as the lord hath prospered them um and uh just, just thought it would be good. The very first mention of the word tithe was Genesis chapter 14. Bible says, verse number 20, And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he, that's Abraham, gave him, that's uh, Melchizedek, tithes of all. So the very first person who should have ever received tithes was the priest that was without mother, without father, Without beginning of life or end of days, it's supposed to be, you're supposed to be given to the Lord Jesus Christ. But I thought that was pretty neat. At least the very first reference of tithe just shows it's it's um, not necessarily always for the Levite, but we should give to God as he has prospered us. And I just, I try and stick with the terms. If you call tithing, giving to the church, it's, it's a little off, right? I mean... I'm not going to say, you know, every pastor is wrong and they're not right with God because they say that. Listen, people are doing their best, but according to the Bible, the, uh, some people are doing their best, I should say. But according to the Bible, what is tithes is giving of the a tenth of the increase of the land, of the herd, of the flocks, the fruit of the trees, the fruit of the ground. Three times a year, maybe once every three years. It's certainly not what the church should be doing, 
which is giving every single week on the first day of the week. All right. Amen. Appreciate that, Bird Justin. And I, I wanna I wanna I know we want to get to that next question here, but let me just say this. I'm gonna try to read this as fast as I can, okay? God has 12 tribes that make up the nation of Israel. He took one of those tribes, the tribe of Levi, and separated them. Then he moved Levi into a separate class and moved Joseph out of the reckoning and put his two boys, Ephraim and Manasseh, in his place. So there were still 12 tribes. Levi became the odd man out, the 13th tribe. The 12 tribes were to feed the Levitical tribe so the Levites could spend all their time ministering ministering to and serving the Lord and his people. The tithe was to provide for the material needs of the Levites. If one out of every 13 citizens of Israel could be fully supported by the legal tithe of the other 12, so the passage in Malachi would be clear. Number one, the Jew was to tithe as a matter of law. Number two, the tithe was to be brought to one building, the storehouse. There was not a storehouse in every town. Number three, the tithe was food to feed the Levites. Number four, if the people did not tithe, God would curse them. And number point five, if the people did tithe, their blessings would be so abundant that they would have no room for them. Which brings me to this, a little bit of what uh, Brother Justin was mentioning, Leviticus 27, 31. And if a man will at all redeem all of his tithes, he shall add thereto the fifth part thereof. Now, Justin already said this, but I'll just read what I have. To give money according to the law of Israel, you would be giving 30%, not 10%. Levites did not have time to go to the store to sh or shop and barter for groceries. They were busy serving God, and God did not want them uh, busy trading at the market. So the people either brought them uh, something to eat, or if they brought money, they brought 20% on top of the 10%. Most preachers don't preach tithing, but they preach Malachi 3 out of context. But Leviticus 27, 32, and concerning the tithe of the herd or of the flock, even of whatsoever passeth under the rod, the tenth shall be holy unto the Lord. So number one, you have 10% of cattle. Number two, you have 10% of sheep. And number three, 10% of any livestock that you have. So if you get the very best ones and bring them to God, that would be Leviticus 27, 33. He shall not search whether it be good or bad, neither shall he change it. And if he change it at all, then both it and the change thereof shall be holy. It shall not be redeemed. So we said it, get the very best ones and bring them to God. Number two, if you get a bad one and realize that God shouldn't be getting a bad one, then don't take the bad one out of the offering. Number three, bring the bad one and the good one to show God you are sorry for thinking that way. Point four, you are not only to give 10%, but the best 10%. If you are not willing in your heart to give God the best 10%, then you better give God a little more than that to appease him. Now, let me say this. Let me say this. I want to close out the question um, with, a, with just two, two points here. The Levites had no land. They had nothing but the service of God in the temple and tabernacle. They cannot grow crops. They cannot raise livestock. They do not have one half acre of land to do it on. They have nothing but the service of the Lord. The sacrifices offered by the Levites were given in addition to the tithe. The building of the temple and its or ornamentation was accomplished with offerings in addition to the tithe. The tithe was strictly for the sustenance of the ministers. If I were to teach that tithing was not exclusively part of the Jewish law, but applied to the New Testament church, I would have to say 10% of everything you have is to come into this storehouse, and it all goes to me. We don't want to give Brother Ed all that money. <laughs> the upkeep of the building, the funding of our outreach, etc., is all extra money offered after I get the tithe. That is what the Bible teaches. Imagine getting your financial statement from the church at the end of the year, and it said, tithes 200000 pastor salary 200000 <laughs> Okay, so um, a, a few other things. Hold on. I, I was going to. I wanted to hit the, what Justin hit on the uh, 2 Corinthians 9-7. Now, now, go there real quick. Go to 2 Corinthians 9-7. Every man, 
according as he per or, uh, just go back one verse here. I want to get the context here. Uh, verse six, Second Corinthians nine six. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he hath purposed purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, nor of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. What am I doing? I'm preaching the cheerful giver doctrine. I'm hard. I'm going to be dogmatic. Um, you got to obey this law. The cheerful giver doctrine. Amen. <laughs> All right. I'm, I'm just kidding. Um, that statement could not be true of 2 Corinthians 9, 7, if 10% was a fixed law for everyone. In 2 Corinthians 9, 2, we, uh, uh, it, it's, um, let's hit that. 2 Corinthians 9, 2, it says, for I know the forwardness of your mind for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia and a, that Achaia was ready a year ago and your zeal hath provoked very many. So in 2 Corinthians 9, 2, we, we see uh, they have a ready mind. In 2 Corinthians 9, 7, we see a purposed heart. The amount of a Christian is uh, the amount of a Christian is to give. Oh, how do I say this? The amount a Christian is to give is entirely, get ready for this, is entirely voluntary and is a matter of the extent to which he loves the Savior from his heart. Every man according as he hath purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity. So in unmistakable language, with perfect clarity, the head of the body speaks by God, the Holy Spirit, and says to the members of the body of Christ, I want you to, point one, give in accord with the condition of your heart. Number two, do not give if you are going to do so with a bad spirit. Number three, do not give because you think it is necessary. So if in your heart you purpose to give 10%, then do so. If you purpose to give 15 or 20%, that is better still. However, if you have no joy in giving, keep your money. God wants nothing from you that you do not want to give to him. The verse we just read says it is not necessary that you give. Are you telling me that if I don't give my $50 and you don't give your $50, the gates of hell will prevail against the church? I don't think so, buddy. The Lord will just find someone who loves him more than you do, or I do, and they will give twice as much. They will reap twice as much and I'll just miss out on all the joy and blessing I should have had if I'd have just loved the Lord. <laughs> but my failure to serve the Lord and his church by giving will not bring the work of the gospel to a halt. Okay, so I just want to say that much. I had a lot of notes on this. I just want to say that much that, um, guys, there is no limit to give. There's no limit. There's no minimal limit. There's no maximum limit. If you have if you have one cent and that's all you have, that's all you have, but you're giving that to the Lord, that is huge. That is huge. You've given everything as opposed to somebody that has, you know, $3 million in the bank and he only gave five bucks. <laughs> this guy <laughs> gave everything. So... God's God doesn't look at how much you give. He's looking at your heart's desire to honor and love him. You know, you're going to love somebody. You're going to give your money to somebody. And whatever you give your money to, there's going to be affection going that direction to what you give your money for. Oh, man, you know what? That new iPhone's coming out, man. I got to have that. And you put all that money on that. You're risking you're risking the presents that you would buy for your kid's birthday. <laughs> You're, you're over there. You're 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 spending all the money for from groceries. Your wife's like, man, we can't even buy all the groceries because you want that that phone. And he's like, oh, I gotta have it. I gotta have it. No, you got affections towards that that phone. Your that money that that money that's going that direction. That's your affection. And you're gonna give your money to something or someone. Why not give it to God? I'm like, I'm not saying it's wrong to buy a phone. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, isn't it sad if you love a phone more than you love God? Is it sad if you love a car or a house or or a diamond ring more than you love God? 
That's that's a condition of your heart. And that's why you've got to, it, 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 the ball's in your court to examine your own heart. You know, how much are you going to give? Can you look in the mirror and say, I love the Lord with the money I gave? See, that's something that that ball is in your court. You've got to answer that question. But I'm telling you, I, I don't see anything wrong with giving 10%. If you're saying, well, that's a good limit to give. I mean, if I want to give myself a minimum, I'll, I'll, I'll do a 10% limit. But there's no law for that. I mean, what if somebody wants to say, well, 20% is my limit? Well, I won't go below 20% because I'm, there's something wrong. There's a, something wrong with the condition of my heart. There's something wrong with the condition of what I'm spending my money on. <laughs> so I want to, you know, you can make those guidelines yourself and they're subjective. Um, it's okay. But somebody else can't come along or your pastor can't come along and try to put you under some Malachi three. I mean, that's ridiculous. Don't, don't do that. That's dishonest. That's dishonest in the scriptures. And a lot of people are using the scriptures wrongly to put you under some law so they can gain. And we don't want to be of those people. Okay. So there it is. I don't know if Bert Justin has anything more to say about that. I'll go ahead and let him say what is peace. No, but I think if that's not, good. Yeah, we can move on. Yeah, if not, we'll go on to the next question here. And let me go ahead and throw that up. And here we go. Dan King. Dan King. And let me get a, a, my notes where that's actually presented. Here it is. Two questions for your next Q&A. Number one. So this is from Dan King. Please refute the Calvinist stance of how God hardened Pharaoh's heart first before he hardened his own heart in Exodus 4.21 as their proof in how God elects. Point two, can you please explain what God means in choosing us in, in regards to salvation? Possible verses to refer to? Psalm 65, 4, Matthew 20, verse 16, and John 15, 16. Thanks once again, and God bless. All right, here we go. I'm going to I'm gonna slam this. I'm going to slam it first, and I'm going to pass it over to Justin. I Justin's going to have an easy night tonight. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, I, 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 I hammer Justin many times on other broadcasts. I, I just go ahead, brother. You start off. Well, I wanna, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not beyond that. I, I'll take the heat sometimes. I don't mind, okay? So let, let me go ahead and open up here. So here's what I want to say on Dan's first question here. Please refute the Calvinist stance of how God hardened Pharaoh's heart first before he hardened his own heart, Exodus 4.21, as their proof how God elects. So to deal in answering Calvinists, and I, I just need to make a broad statement here, to deal in answering Calvinists concerning one doctrine, we find it problematic for Calvinists to correct themselves if you disprove them wrong scripturally on one point of their doctrinal belief in TULIP. Uh, if you don't know what TULIP is, you're new to this thing. Uh, TULIP is their, their five-point doctrinal stance as Calvinists. If you deny TULIP, you pretty much deny Calvinism. Because uh, Calvinism rests upon the foundation of tulip. It's uh, total depravity, and correct me if I'm wrong on some of these, total, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. And that would be their five-point doctrine, and uh, all stand together. But I, I contend if you can tear down the T and tulip, you can, the whole thing will come crumbling down. Total depravity, once you disprove that, it all comes crumbling down. And so you have to believe in tulip concerning total depravity. That is a must. But according to Calvinists, they believe all five points are a must. So they have to stay faithful to the philosophy of tulip in their belief system. And it's not scriptural, by the way. And each doctrine of tulip rests upon all the others. So if you tear down one, it affects them all. So in, so for Calvinists to come out of tulip, the doctrines need to be refuted. To uh, I'm talking about all of them because they they're going to hold on to to anything they can grasp on uh, and have understanding of salvation biblically. So this uh, tulip is mainly concerning salvation. It's a salvation doctrine, according to Calvinist. This may not be in all cases, but the system teaches all or nothing. So we need to define what the word elect means. So do you know what the word elect means? Uh, it, it cannot contradict the gospel of Christ. We need to define uh, the point when, it, when one becomes elect, and it cannot contradict the gospel of Christ. 
So the hardening of Pharaoh's heart shows we are not dealing with someone seeking truth and responding to the light that God has given him, are we? Come on, when you go to the testimony of Pharaoh in Exodus, is Pharaoh like, is Pharaoh like Cornelius? He's like, man, I'm going to pray to God. You know, God, you know, show me the truth. <laughs> Pharaoh is not even in the vicinity of Cornelius. And then Cal and you're, you're telling me that Calvinists are using Pharaoh's heart as an illustration on how God elects people? <laughs> That's a joke. It's a complete and utter joke. So Calvinists don't see the Bible as the final authority. At that, that point needs to be made. They see their own intellect and Calvin's philosophy and Tulip as the final authority. A Presbyterian confession of faith as the final authority, even if it contradicts the Bible. The hardening of Pharaoh's heart would be a bad example to compare how God deals in salvation or election. Pharaoh is an example of God's mercy. Pharaoh, come on, let me say it again. Pharaoh is an example of God's mercy to those that do not uh, do not and will not respond to the light and mercy, long-suffering, grace, proof, and evidence, as well as the repeated chances that God has given him to repent and believe. Pharaoh is not an example of how God elects people. Pharaoh is an example of lost people who don't have to remain lost, but want to remain lost. That's what he's an example of. So, with that being said, because I'm, I'm not going to suck everything up here and leave Justin with an empty glass, but um, I, I want to I wanna do this. I, I, I got to do this. Justin, you got to let me do this. Go ahead, brother. I want you, I want you to look at Exodus. So go to Exodus. Now, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. Go to Exodus. And what was the verse that Dan King gave in? in Four verse 20. Uh, what was that? Four Exodus 421. Okay. So Exodus 420. I want to read this. Now watch this. And the Lord said unto Moses, when you, when thou goest to return into Egypt, see that thou do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in thine hand, but I will harden his heart that he shall not let the people go. Right there, Exodus 421. God didn't harden his heart yet. He's telling him he's going to harden his heart. You can't say that's the first time God hardened his heart. He's giving the prophets, he's speaking prophetically that he's going to harden his heart. Mm -hmm. So you can't take Exodus 420. Well, well, I looked up hardened heart and Exodus 421 said hardened heart. That's the first time you hardened Pharaoh's heart. That's what people do. They don't read the context. So point one, you're wrong. God didn't harden his heart right there. <laughs> All right. So now that we said that, now let me get, let me, let's get to this whole Exodus thing of the actual hardening of Pharaoh's heart. Now, I want you to go to Exodus chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. Now watch this. This is going to be pretty interesting uh, as we, we, we reveal the, the truth of Pharaoh's hardened heart. Now, Exodus 7, 13. Now look at this. And he hardened Pharaoh's heart, that he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. Now, who hardened Pharaoh's heart there? The Lord, correct? <laughs> so there you have the first instance where the Lord hardens his heart. Now, I want you to cross-reference this verse with Exodus 8.32. Now go there, Exodus 8.32. Now watch this. <laughs> And Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time. Now watch. Also, <laughs> that means the Exodus 7, 13 to 14, Pharaoh hardened his heart there too. <laughs> so who, who hardened Pharaoh's heart in Exodus 8, 32, the verse that we're at right now? Pharaoh did. Who hardened his heart in Exodus 7, 13 to 14? Well, now we can say Pharaoh did and the Lord did, right? Yeah, that's a good one. Now watch this. Watch this. Go to Exodus 7.22. Go to Exodus 7.22. Watch this one. And the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Neither did he hearken unto them as the Lord had said. Who hardened his heart right there? Doesn't say, does it? <laughs> <laughs> so, so we got to classify this as neutral, right? So this is a neutral. We don't know. It could be either or. So watch this. I, now, I'm saying all this. We're going to get to the end and we're going to answer all the questions here. But I just want to show you something. If you're honest, 
Now, remember, we're in Exodus 7.22, right? One chapter after Exodus 7 is what? Exodus chapter 8, right? Go back to Exodus 8.32. Go, go there. Let's do it again. And Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also, neither would he let the people go. So I contend we could use Exodus 8.32 for Exodus 7.22 and Exodus 7.13 and 14. That Pharaoh hardened his heart in both of the prior times. See how we did that? See, people want to make a dogmatic claim about that, but I've got scriptural proof that you could doubt that. People want to be so dogmatic. We've got doubt here. Now, let, now, let, now do Exodus 8.15. Let's do the next one. Point three, Pharaoh Hardness Heart. Uh, we, we can prove Pharaoh Hardness Heart, Exodus 7 13. Pharaoh Hardness Heart, Exodus 7 22. We, now we're going to Pharaoh Hardness his Heart, Exodus 8 15. So the third time, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. Now look at this. But when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, he hardened his heart and hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. So who hardened his heart there? Who hardened his heart there? Pharaoh did, right? Pharaoh hardened his heart. Now go to the next one. Exodus 8.19. Exodus 8.19. We're doing the next one. Now watch this. Then the magician said unto him, Pharaoh, this is the finger of God, the, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. Who hardened Pharaoh's heart there? It doesn't say. It doesn't say. It's one of them neutral ones again, right? <laughs> where I, We're still in Exodus 8, 19, and I can go to where? Exodus 8, 32, where it says, Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also, which means all the prior times, Pharaoh hardened his heart. Well, let's do the next one, Exodus 8, 32, which we already read. We know that kind of pretty good now. And so we know right there, Pharaoh hardened his heart. So that's point five. That's the fifth time Pharaoh hardens his heart. And number six, Exodus 9, 7. Now look at this one. And Pharaoh sent, and behold, there was not one of the cattle of the Israelites dead. Now watch. And the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people go. Exodus 9, 7. Who hardened his heart? It doesn't say. <laughs> So, so I don't, I don't have an Exodus eight thirty two to go to. <laughs> okay, hold on, we're, we're gonna get there though. Okay, now go to the next part. We're gonna come back to that. All the neutral ones, we're gonna come back to point seven, Exodus nine thirty four to thirty five. Now look at this one. And when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunders were ceased, he sinned yet more and hardened his heart. He and his servants. So not only did Pharaoh harden his heart, but it's, it says his servants hardened their hearts as well. So we have point seven, Pharaoh hardened his heart, correct? Mm -hmm. Did Pharaoh harden his heart? It says right there, he did. He hardened his heart. So what can we get off of the truth of all seven points of the hardening of Pharaoh's heart? That Pharaoh hardened his heart. That's what we're getting. Now, when you do the same context... Now, bear with me. We're going we're gonna to go through this pretty quick because I want to give Justin a chance to. The Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart in Exodus 7, 13, correct? And 14, we said that. But then we showed that Pharaoh also hardened his heart, correct? Now, Exodus 9, 7, it actually says, and the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and we can assume the Lord hardened his heart there. But remember, it's one of those neutral things. But we can assume he did because we can go to the prophecy where God says, I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart. So all these verses, whether it's Exodus 7, 13 to 14, Exodus 9, 7, Exodus 9, 12, Exodus 10, 1, Exodus 10, 27, Exodus 11, 10, Exodus 14, 8, in which it equals seven times where the Lord hardens his heart, we can summate that with the hardening of Pharaoh's heart that he hardened himself. Which means what? Every time Pharaoh hardened his heart, God gave him what he wanted. He hardened his heart. All seven times, Pharaoh hardened his heart first, and God's response to that was, I'm going to harden your heart. That means that God didn't make Pharaoh harden his heart. Calvinism is wrong. Pharaoh hardens his own heart, and God says, well, I knew he was going to do it. I knew he was going to do it. Now I'm going to give him what he wants. Amen. See, Calvinism Amen. is a lie. Because... Amen. Uh, 
I know Justin can explain this, and I hope Justin does on, on his side. Uh, the Romans 1 it was a really good cross-reference to this, but I don't want to take all the all the, the, the reasoning here. I'm going to give, I'm going to pass it over to Justin. Go ahead, brother. All right, brother. Appreciate that. That's good stuff. So uh, yeah, just like brother Ed said, let me start off by saying Calvinism is a lie. That is, that is a deceit from the devil teaching this kind of crazy stuff that God purposed a few people to, uh, to go be with him and blessing with salvation and everybody else he just damned to hell because that's he's a sovereign god that's nonsense now uh, right. the definition of sovereign is supreme ruler so I, i'll go with that but but nowhere in the bible is is god called sovereign right so keep that right. in mind uh so let's go to a couple of places right exodus chapter four real quick exodus chapter four verse 21 the bible says and the lord said unto moses when thou goest to return into egypt see that thou do all those wonders which uh, wonders before pharaoh which i have put in thine hand but i will like brother ed said i will harden his heart that he should not let the people go so he says i will that mean he hadn't done it yet he hadn't done it yet back to uh, exodus chapter 7 exodus chapter 7 verse number 1 and the lord said unto moses see I have made thee a God to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Thou shalt speak all that I command thee, and Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh that he send the children of Israel out of his hand, out of his land. And I, there's a, there it is again. I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. So. Here we go. Exodus chapter 7. God says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. He hadn't done it yet. Exodus chapter 6, just to, just to show you. Um, the Bible says in verse number 5, Exodus chapter 6, verse number 5, and I've also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am, that's present tense, the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. That's future tense. He hadn't done that yet. Uh, and I will rid you out of their bondage. He hadn't done that yet. Exodus chapter 6, right? And I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. And I will take you to me for people. And I will be to you a God. And ye shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will bring you, I will bring you in unto the land concerning the which I did swear to give it to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And I will give it you for an inheritance. I am the Lord. So all that, just, just to point out the use of the word over and over and over and over and over again, will, in these contexts here, God's talking about this is going to happen. But it hadn't happened yet. Fair? I think that's fair. Exodus chapter 5. So, so Exodus chapter 4, God says, Moses, I'm prophesying, I am going to harden Pharaoh's heart. Exodus chapter 7. Okay, which is after four and after five. Keep that in mind. Exodus chapter seven, God says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. Exodus chapter five, verse number one. And afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, let my people go that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. So, so here we go. Moses meets Pharaoh, verse number two, and Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. You know what the problem was? Before God hardened Pharaoh's heart, Pharaoh said, I don't know God. I don't care about God. I'm not going to obey God. I'm not going to listen to God. And, and this is just like Brother Ed saying, all Romans chapter number one, let's just keep reading. And they said, the God of the Hebrews have met with us, met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days journey into the desert and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. 
and the king of Edom said to them, Wherefore do ye, Moses and Aaron, let the people from your works get you unto your burdens? And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land now are many, and ye make them rest from their burdens. And Pharaoh commanded the same day taskmasters of the people and their officers, saying, Ye shall no more give the people straw to make bricks, as heretofore let them go and gather straw for themselves. And the tale of the bricks which they did make heretofore ye shall lay upon them. Ye shall not diminish aught thereof, for they be idle. Therefore they cry, saying, Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Let their more work be laid upon the men, that they may labor therein, and let them not regard, look at what he says, vain words. Pharaoh says, all this stuff Moses is saying is nonsense. That's before God hardens Pharaoh's heart, he wasn't interested. He didn't believe what Moses said. He didn't want to believe what Moses said. He didn't want God. He didn't want to obey God. And he said that his words were vain. They didn't mean anything to him. Romans chapter number one. Romans chapter number one. Now Moses hadn't worked any of those signs yet. And God said that he would harden his heart when he works those signs. But the real problem, the real problem lied in Pharaoh's heart to begin with. Romans chapter one, verse number 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. You don't think Pharaoh ever saw heaven? I think he looked up once in a while. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who, look at this, hold the truth in unrighteousness. Pharaoh knows who God is. Pharaoh knows who the creator is. Pharaoh knows that these people belong to God and they should go and worship him. He just wasn't going to obey. Right. right. So verse number 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. Amen. God showed Pharaoh who he is. Right. Before any of this stuff happened, and Pharaoh's like, I'm not going to listen to you. Who, who's the Lord that I should obey him? Right. Verse number 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power in Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You can't say Pharaoh was doomed because God hardened his heart. Even if it is God that hardened his heart first in Exodus chapter 7. In Exodus chapter 5, Pharaoh said, get away, get away with all this God stuff. I don't want to hear all that God stuff. That's vain words. You know what? You better punish those people for even talking about God, for even regarding all this stuff. We're going to make their lives more difficult. We're going to make their labor more difficult. Pharaoh, Pharaoh was hardened against God before God hardened his heart. No way around it. Exodus chapter 5. Amen. Appreciate that, Bird Justin. Uh, just to kind of, uh, I just want to say a few things too about that. Um, five ways that God can show his power because they go to Romans uh, 9 17, right? Ain't that what people do? Mm -hmm. Turn there really quick. Go to Romans 9 17. I want to show you this. And just to kind of refute the idea, for the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up that I might show, show my power in thee and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. So they're saying that uh, God showing his power in Pharaoh was only for destruction. So whenever God shows his power, it's only for destruction. But I want to show you a refute here of five ways that God can show his power. Genesis 31, 6, it says, And ye know that with all my power I have served your father, obedience to another. Point two, Genesis 31, 29. It, it is in my power of my hand to do you hurt, but the God of your father spake unto me yesterday night, saying, Take thou heed that thou speak not to Jacob, either good or bad, by destroying somebody, someone. Okay, he can show his power by destroying someone. 
And that's what they're they're trying to say in Romans 9, 17. That's the only power that God has. Uh, Psalm 106, verse 8. Nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make his mighty power to be known. God's saving grace. Romans 9, 22. What if God, willing to shew his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, endured with much long suffering God's self control? That's his power, his self control. Uh, Ephesians 3 7, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God uh, given unto me by the effectual working of his power. And that's a changed life. God has power to change a life. So watch out when you go to Romans 9.17 and says God's power in Pharaoh, and it can only be that. Um, that's Calvinism, and normally Calvinists don't like context. They like cherry-picking verses and making them say what they want them to say to match their philosophy and their Presbyterian confession. <laughs> okay, so uh, that's just a, a thing there. Now, let me give you this, and then, and then uh, maybe uh, Justin would want to cover that election thing. But I, I did want to say this. Why did God harden Pharaoh's heart? And, and Justin gave some great answers. But Exodus 14, 4 says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart that that he shall follow after them and I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. So God gives you the answer as to why he hardened Pharaoh's heart. Now look at Exodus 14, 17. And, be, and I behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians. So people don't talk about why did God harden Egyptians' hearts. Come on, you'll, you'll never hear those arguments <laughs> because they don't like, they, come, they zoom in on one area and then they form a whole doctrine out of one area. And, and, and look, it says, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians and they shall follow them. And I will get me honor upon Pharaoh and upon all his host, upon his chariots and upon his horsemen. See, God still had grace. God, God wanted to have grace on Pharaoh and, his, and all the Egyptians. He wasn't out to destroy them. He, he didn't create them to be destroyed. He wanted them to, to understand who he is and give honor to him where honor is due. And Exodus 14, 18, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. When I've gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots and upon his horsemen. So, we did that. Now, the account from the Philistines and priests and diviners. Now, look at their account in 1 Samuel 6.6. 6. Here's what they say in 1 Samuel 6.6, 6, if you want to turn there. Wherefore then do ye harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts? Notice they didn't say God hardened their hearts. <laughs> Come on, what are you doing with that? <laughs> God did, they didn't say God hardened their hearts, so we, we need to all be Calvinists. No, they didn't. They said they hardened their own hearts. When he had wrought wonderfully among them, did they not let the people go and they departed? So that, there, there it is. And then God does not always contribute to the hardening of the heart. See, right there, we talked about how God contributes, right? Every time Pharaoh hardened his heart, God gave him what he wanted, right? But that's not always the case. Uh, uh, look at Hebrews 3.8. Look at Hebrews 3, 8. Watch this. Harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me and saw my works 40 years. God was over there not hardening their hearts. God was trying to prove them to get them to honor him. And what were they doing? They were hardening their hearts. And God's telling you, yes, you can harden your heart. And God would not have anything to do with it. It's your own free will, your own free volition to harden your own heart. Hebrews 3.15. While it is said today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, as some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. And Hebrews 4, 7, again, he limiteth a certain day, saying, in David, today, after so long a time, as it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. You have a choice to hear his voice, or you can harden your heart. But if you harden your heart, there are there is a there is a a form of hardening your heart that God may not have nothing to do with. It's completely you. But what do you do about that as a Calvinist? Remember, 
God created certain people to go to hell and certain people to go to heaven. So God makes your heart hardened from the foundation of the world, obviously, right? He programmed you to have a hardened heart to never get saved because you were created to go to hell. And then other people he created to be saved before the foundation of the world in which there's no meaning for the cross. There's no meaning why redemption needs to be meted out for all of us because we're all sinners. No, that would not be the case. It would be God, uh, according to fatalism, because that's what it is, it's fatalism, because there's no way for a man that's preordained to go to hell to ever get out of his situation. There's no way out. He's predestined to go there. And if he says, I don't want to go there, I'll do anything to not go there. I'll even believe on Jesus. And Jesus has to say, no, I've made you to go to hell. Are you disobeying my will, my sovereign will? Well, no, that's not the case, my friend, because anybody that calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible says, repent towards God and put faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. These things mean nothing. If God already pre preordained your destination, it, they mean nothing at all, nothing. God's just spewing out hot air in the, in, in, in the Bible. Preachers and apostles are preaching hot air. These, these, these words mean nothing. Paul getting saved and going into the synagogues, it means nothing. Peter going out and, and, and Peter getting rebuked by Paul means nothing. All that means nothing because the gospel is empty. It's vain. God has already created people to go to heaven and people to go to hell. God already knows everything you're going to do before you do it. He's followed you all the way to the end of your course. So he already knows the decisions you're going to make before you make them. So you're already going to hell if you're going to hell. You're already going to heaven if you're going to heaven. You don't need Jesus. You don't need the gospel. The blood was shed for nothing. Obviously, we know that's all lies lies. The Bible is true. And Romans 3, 4, let God be true, but every man a liar. And I would say every man a liar, especially if you're denying the word of truth. If you're denying the word of truth, rightly divided, and it's dealing with salvation, why am I going to believe you about anything else? Matthew Henry, <laughs> why am I going to believe you about anything else? You know, uh, Charles Spurgeon, who people love Charles Spurgeon because he did a lot of preaching against Calvinism. Man, you can't be a preacher and be a Calvinist. They contradict. Spurgeon, didn't you know that much? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I, I understand. You know, people like, you know, I always get, see quotes from people that, don't believe in Calvinism. They quote some Spurgeon stuff. I just, I just be careful with that. You know, watch out what you're promoting to people because somebody that's not grounded in the Bible is going to look at your Spurgeon quote and end up getting a hold of what Spurgeon believed, Calvinism. And that's a dangerous place to be because it's, it's an attack on the gospel of Christ. It is. Tulip is an attack on the cross work of Jesus Christ. You better be careful when you start reading them commentaries because 99.9 .9 of those commentaries are Calvinistic in nature. Be careful. It's so easy to be swayed by these guys. They give great arguments, but they're not scriptural arguments. We want to stick in the Bible. Get yourself a King James Bible. Believe the Bible over your commentaries. Okay, so uh, anyways, that, that's it. I don't know, Justin, you want to cover any more? on that or maybe we can save the rest for for the next broadcast um we can continue on with the part was he had a yeah, two-part question didn't part two and then we'll get the rest on the next broadcast so you want to go ahead and do the part two yeah. okay so let's go ahead and get that part two and let me get that on the screen here um Okay, can you explain what God means in choosing us in regards to salvation? Possible verses uh, to refer, Psalm 65, 4, Matthew 20, verse 16, and John 15, 16. And I'll read you the, the Psalm 65, 4. Blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causest to approach unto thee, that he may dwell in thy courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple. Go ahead, brother. Sure. 
All right, so uh, to start off, let me look at one thing here, one reference here. Do, 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 do. Yes, okay. So uh, let's read this, right? Number number one says in uh, verse number four, blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causest to approach unto thee that he may dwell in thy courts. All that's singular. Then we shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even thy holy temple. So uh, let read that one more time, then we'll get some cross-references. Blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causest to approach unto thee, that he may dwell in thy courts. Numbers chapter 16. Verse number five, the Bible says, And he spake unto Korah and unto all his company, saying, Even tomorrow the Lord will show who are his and who is holy and will cause him to come near unto him, even him whom he hath chosen will he cause to come near unto him. Sounds like a pretty good cross-reference to me. Talking about God choosing somebody to come near unto him. Right, so verse number six, this do take the censers, core and all his company, and he put fire therein and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow. And it shall be them that the man whom the Lord doth choose, there it is again, he shall be holy. Ye take too much upon you, ye sons of Levi. And Moses said to Korah, Here I pray you, ye sons of Levi, seemeth it but a small thing unto you that God, that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to minister unto them. And he hath brought thee near to him and all thy brethren, the sons of Levi, with thee, and seek ye the priesthood also. Seek ye the priesthood also. All right, then uh, verse number 12. Um, verse, num uh, verse 12, And Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, which said, We will not come up. And he said, uh, is it, it is a small thing that thou hast brought us up out of the land that floweth with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness, except thou make thyself altogether a prince over us. Uh, so they they just, they're, they're, um, they're rising up in rebellion. Let me go on a little bit here. I don't want to read all of this here. Let's see. Okay, verse number 28. And Moses said, Hereby ye shall know that the Lord hath sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of my own mind, mine own mind. If these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open her mouth, and swallow them up with all that appertain unto them, and they go down quick into the pit, then ye shall understand that these men have, uh, have provoked the Lord. And it came to pass, as he made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up in their houses, and all the men that, uh, that appertained unto Korah and all their goods. So uh, these men rise up against Moses and against Aaron, and they're trying to take the priesthood. God said that there is a man that he chose to come near unto him. And at that time, we read, it's pointing to Aaron. It's pointing to the priesthood. Look at um, Deuteronomy. So Numbers, Deuteronomy. Book of Deuteronomy, chapter 21. <clears throat> chapter 21, verse number uh, 5. Look at what it says. And the priests the sons of levi shall come near for them the lord thy god hath chosen to minister unto him and to bless in the name of the lord and by their word shall every controversy and every stroke be tried there it is again god chose the priesthood to come near unto him um let's look at psalm 105 
Psalm 105. Keep Psalm 65. We'll come right there. Um, Psalm 105. 105 and go to verse number 26. Psalm 105, verse 26. He sent Moses, his servant, and Aaron, whom he had chosen. Now, hold on, hold on. Psalm, Psalm 65, verse number four. Blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causest to approach unto thee, that he may dwell in thy courts. That's, that's talking about the priest. It's talking about the priest. That at the time was Aaron. We, we saw that in some of the, the history there. We saw us talking about the sons of Levi. However... Get with that. Hebrews chapter 7. Quickly here. We can try and put this together. Hebrews chapter 7. Um, the Bible says this in the book of Hebrews chapter 7, beginning at verse number 11. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, there is made a, of, an, of necessity a change also of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest who is made not after the law of the carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. For he testifieth, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. And inasmuch as not without an oath he was made priest, for those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. And truly, were, uh, they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Right, so Psalm 65, the man whom God chose is the priest. That was Aaron for a little while. Aaron died. Right, that was Aaron's sons for a little while, and they died. And none of those priests could continue because <laughs> all they did was die. I'm telling you, Psalm 65, verse number four, is not talking about individual Christians. It's talking mm -hmm. about the Lord Jesus Christ. He's Amen. the one whom the Lord chose. He's the one that caused to approach unto God. He's the one Very that good. goes before us to minister. And look, he dwells in the courts of God. And because he does that, look at what it says. We, we shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple. See that? <laughs> because Jesus Christ, the unchanging priest, the unchangeable priesthood, goes before God the Father, cause, uh, draw, draw near unto God, who, who's approaching to God for us. You know what we get? Satisfaction. Goodness from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That ain't talking about Calvinism. That ain't talking about some Christian being chosen by God. That's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, that unchangeable priest by whom we can be glad and have rejoicing. So, Brother Ed, I'll let you take it from there. All right. I'm going to try to put this in fifth gear because we're already over 28 minutes. <laughs> and I'm, I am going to do my best to fly through these. And you know how it goes when Brother Ed flies through these. Sometimes it takes longer than what I'd like. So let's, let me do my best. Let me go ahead and get started. Election almost always, almost always refers to somebody other than the believer. One more time. Election almost always refers to somebody other than the believer. So you got your little objective definition that Calvinists give, 
And then on this side, on the right side, you have the correct biblical definition of election. So really quick, let me paraphrase, according to the Noel Epsters, 1828, let me paraphrase some of these definitions of election here really quickly. Number one, act of choosing. Number two, voluntary preference. Number three, power of choosing or selecting. Uh, divine choice, public choice. Seven, public choice. Okay, so a little bit paraphrase there, some of those definitions. And so it's choosing, right? The power of choice. So let's talk about some of these elect individuals or groups that are, that are other than the believer and including the believer. Watch this. Number one, Justin covered this one greatly. Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2, 6, Isaiah 42, 1, and 1 Peter 1, verse 2. Number two, the church in him. That's the church in in Christ, right? That's Ephesians 1, 4 and 1 Peter 5, 13. You've got to be in him. You've got to be in Christ because he's the elect. Yeah. So if you're not in Christ, you're not elect. Yeah. So when do I become elect? Before I'm in Christ or after I'm in Christ? Well, according to Ephesians 1, 4 and 1 Peter 5, 13, it's after I'm in Christ. So guess what, guys? Once I become elect, I'm chosen. I got to choose Jesus first, then he chooses me. How about that? that uh, come on. Well, well, I don't agree with you. Well, I agree with the Bible. Point three, angels. 1 Timothy 5.21, elect angels. Well, are they elect to go to heaven or hell? How about neither? <laughs> Read it. 1 Timothy 5.21, they're, they're chosen angels. They're not going to heaven or hell. Come on, get on board, guys. Biblical, get on board biblically. Nation of Israel, Isaiah 45, 4, they're elect. Israel, mine elect, nothing good to say about them. <laughs> what did they do that was so great besides idolatry and just constantly disrespecting and dishonoring God? <laughs> really? Okay, and then point five, individuals. Uh, Acts 9.15, Paul is elect. Look, for he is a chosen vessel unto me. Uh, Romans 16.13, Rufus is elect. Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord. Look at 2 John 1. We have the elect unto the, or uh, elder, the elder unto the elect lady and her children. So, uh, so we have elect children, amen. Praise the Lord for elect children. About you. you, are you a elect child from the foundation of the world? If you're not an elect child, your child's going to hell. <laughs> Where do you come up with this stuff, guys? It's just it just means they're they're chosen. Tribulation saints. Look at that one. Matthew 24, 24, for there shall arise uh, false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders in so much that it were possible they shall deceive the very elect. So the uh, chosen tribulation saints, right? And then, uh, so we got six, six there. We had one of them is the church, right? And the other ones were had nothing to do with the church. So Calvinism is wrong. That's, it summates uh, the answer. Calvinism is wrong. It's not biblical. No, we got so many verses that show it's wrong. I mean, how many ways can you say it's wrong? So let's give another way real quick here. Um, make your election sure. How do you do that? That's Second Peter 1.10, right? And then you have Second Peter 1.9 uh, answers the context. Simon Peter, servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteous uh, righteousness of God and of our Savior, Jesus Christ. It answers the context. It's certainty. It's full confidence. Help thou mine unbelief. I need confidence. That's what it means to make your election sure. It doesn't mean that I make my election sure by uh, believing the Presbyterian confession. <laughs> it's not making my election sure believing in Tulip. It's having confidence in what Jesus Christ did, his righteousness, his finished cross work. That's how I get confidence in the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, I get confidence in the Bible. That's how I make my election sure. Confidence. Confidence. 
Now watch this. Problems with Calvinism's definition of election. Go to Romans 8.32. We got to fly through these. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us some things or all things? Now watch this. Look at verse 33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Wait a minute. If God's justifying, if God's justifying the elect, why do they need to be justified if they're already elect? They don't need to be justified, which means you can lay charge to, to God's elect if they're not justified. Wow. That wait, hold up. Wait, say that again. <laughs> if you tell that to a Calvinist, they're not going to get it. Oh, wait a minute. That goes against Tulip. <laughs> okay, uh, next one. Problems with, with Calvinism's definition of election. Go to 1 Peter 3.18. Go to 1 Peter 3.18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Uh, if you can't be charged with anything, then Jesus didn't die for you. The just for the unjust. You're unjust. Jesus didn't die for you. Jesus didn't die for the unjust, but what does it say? The, un the just for the unjust. So if you're elect, you're unjust, right? Right? Didn't he die for the elect? Which means, which means, now watch it, watch this definition very carefully. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. In the definition of elect that I'm talking about, every single human being is written in the book of life. Every single human being is elect in the definition I'm talking about that Jesus died for everyone. But what, what, what is the definition struggle that we're having? Is that it's a gift and that those that receive it, those that receive it are now becoming the, the elect the predestination and everything that we're talking about that deals with ordained and all that happens after you get saved. So you have a definition of elect that God died for all because God wants all people to be saved. It's in his will in 2 Peter 3, 9 and 1, 1 Timothy 2, 4, who will have all men to be saved. So God wants all people to be saved, but only a few are going to respond, right? Matthew chapter 7, straight as the gate narrows way that leadeth unto life and few there be that find it. Only a few people are going to find it. But God doesn't want only a few people to find it. His heart's desires for all people to find it. But the, but, the, but the fact of the matter is God knows what's in man. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. So God knows what man loves. God knows the nature of man. So God wants all people to be saved. The call goes out to everybody. So in a sense, all are elect, but not all will be saved. See that? Only those that believe on Jesus Christ get saved and then become elect. They become chosen in the fact they ha now have the redemption. They now have it. Okay? So we did a little bit of that. And then uh, uh, John 16, 7 to 9, also the Holy Spirit um, reproves of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And why does he do that if you're already elect? Well, he... He, he does that to those that he regenerates. If you respond, if you respond correctly, you can be regenerated. So the elect, now, now let me hit this last one here. The elect are righteous from the foundation of the world according to Calvinism, correct? That's what they believe. The elect are righteous from the foundation of the world according to Calvinism. Romans eleven twenty eight. 28, watch this. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. Wait a minute. They're enemies of the gospel? you telling me elect people are enemies of the gospel? Well, wait. If you're a Calvinist, get that thinking cap on. How are you an enemy of the gospel? And you're saying that only elect people God's chosen to be saved. <laughs> Here you have elect people that are enemies of the gospel, then the gospel is the only means of salvation. Okay, so you got a problem there at Romans 9, 15. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So God will have mercy on whom he will. You can't do anything about it. So if God wants to have mercy on all people, 
What are you going to do? You can't do anything about that. You can't control God's mind. Jonah 2.8, look at this one. How about this one for a Calvinistic refute? Jonah chapter 2, verse 8. Let me go back one verse here. This is pretty good. When my soul fainteth within me, I remember the Lord. Did you? Uh, and my prayer came in unto the into thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. Irresistible grace, unconditional election. <laughs> How can you forsake your own mercy? <laughs> it's impossible. You can't do it if you want to. And right there, the Bible refutes you in Jonah 2.8. They forsook their own mercy. What a shame that we're supposed to believe your philosophy, your tulip above the Bible. No, thank you. I believe Jonah 2.8. Romans 9, 9 to 13. I'm going to fly through these. We got to get through these. Uh, before a person is born, God can choose as regards uh, uh, concerning the kingdom of heaven. God can choose concerning those things. It's just choosing. It has nothing to do with salvation. It has something to do with what they're going to be doing on the planet. Okay, again, Romans 9, 9 to 13. He chose the elder to serve the younger. That's basically what I said. Not going to uh, choose regarding the kingdom of God without giving you some sort of choice, right? And then Romans 9, 17, did God, and we, we, we hit this already. Did God raise up Pharaoh? Yes. Did God destroy Pharaoh? Yes. Did God raise up Pharaoh to destroy him? No. <laughs> no. No, because that would make God maniacal and mean. <laughs> God's not maniacal and mean. He's not creating people to go to hell. He raised them up to make his power known. So people could look at that testimony and, and not follow the same steps that Pharaoh made in his own free volition and free choice, apart from God making him do anything. Because God didn't make him do anything. He did it all on his own, okay? So God doesn't harden anyone's heart. They harden it first. And, we, you know, again, we're going back to that. God doesn't give anyone over to a reprobate mind until they give themselves over to a reprobate mind first. And Justin covered that immaculately. And I wanted to end with that thought because I think it's so important that uh, God responds into what we do. And and Calvinists don't, don't, they are out of that loop. They're out of that biblical principle. They are completely making us a bunch of robots that are programmed by God that we're either we're either created saved or created lost, and, and our minds are programmed that when I, if, I don't even want to use me as an example for this, but when a man rapes a baby, God made him rape that baby. See, I go to the extreme circumstance to show you how, how critical it is that you're not Calvinist because that's what you'll have to believe if, if you believe in this fatalism, that God makes you do sinful things, which makes God a sinner. God is a sinner if you're a Calvinist, and you can't get out of it because Tulip is set up that God knows everything you're going to do before you do it, including the sins you do which makes God a sinner. And, and, and I'm sorry, my God is holy. He's righteous. He's just, and he's true. He's, he's holy in the sense he's absolutely righteous according to the word of God. So I want you to think about that. If you're still leaning towards Calvinism, I want you to think of, think seriously about this, because remember, if you're a Calvinist and you believe in Tulip, there is no need for the cross of Jesus Christ. There's no need. There's no need to go out and preach the gospel. There's no need for it because God has already elected people to go to heaven and hell. I'm sorry. That's fatalism at its worst. That is the worst doctrine you could ever believe in. And so many people believe it. Don't believe that garbage. And it's garbage. It sounds great. It's philosophical tickling of the ears. It sounds like you're honoring God when you say God knows everything. But then when you really zoom into what it is, God knows the sins you're doing and he's making you do them. You better repent of that stuff. And I'm, I'm going to go ahead and end with this. If you're a Calvinist, or if you're not a Calvinist, or you're leaning that way, you're not leaning that way, but you've been exposed to a lot of Calvinistic literature and you're kind of like divided because you don't really know too much. I would say, take it from me and brother Justin. We've studied this thing out. We went to Bible school. We looked at these things and we, we look at them according to the Bible. 
And we're asking you to do the same thing. Look at all the verses we gave tonight. Judge for yourself if Calvinism and Tulip and all that is honoring Christ or if it's dismissing what Christ came to do in his purpose and his redemptive work and his blood that was shed and his meaningfulness in obeying the Father, all that becomes meaningless and vain. I want you to look at that very carefully. Um, uh, and there, there's a lot of people that don't realize they're Calvinists. They don't even realize it, but they have a, when you ask them certain questions, they got these Calvinistic answers. They don't even realize they're Calvinists. Some people don't even know what it is. But they're, they're Calvinist because everybody they know believes these doctrines, and they spew out these doctrines. They go to churches that believe these doctrines, and they think they're great. They think they're biblical. So be careful. I warn you. Warn you in love. Don't be swayed to go down that road. Learn your Bible. Look at the verses me and Brother Justin gave you. And if you're not saved, apart from Calvinism, because I'm not a Calvinist, you need to take your free volition and free will, and you need to put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, not because he made you do it, but because it's your free will to do it and receive the free gift of grace and mercy and love and compassion and the, 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 the cross work and the shed blood that he did for you to receive that love from the cross work and receive it, trust in it, believe on it, that he died for your sins, he rose again the third day. And when you do that, you're saved, you're reconciled to God, sins are forgiven, and you have eternal life. What a great gift. God allows us to choose him. And when we're chosen, guess what? We become elect. Go ahead, Brother Justin. Amen. No, thank you. Uh, thank you, Brother Ed. Thank you for asking questions. I appreciate all of it. And uh, certainly a blessing to, uh, to look at these. Man, I, that Calvinist doctrine, it really is straight from hell. It makes God a sinner. It makes God the author of sin. I'd get far away yep. from that stuff and just believe the Bible. Amen. Okay, y'all have a great and wonderful evening.